Latest in the fight against COVID-19, cases climbing to staggering levels as data shows a record 325,000 more children tested positive for COVID-19 last week, according to a new report from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Kids accounted for about 17.4% of a weekly reported COVID-19 cases. This comes as the FDA is expanding its recommendation for booster shots. Uh, to give us some insight on the surge of COVID-19 in children is professor of economics at Brown University and author of the book, The Family Firm, Emily Oster. Emily, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So let's, uh, let, let's use the, the COVID school data hub for districts in New Jersey. We've taken a look at this. You found uh, that the largest, 50 largest districts, 54% are still using virtual learning, which is nearly the same compared to last year. What does that tell you about the progress we're making and maybe about uh, the attitude that schools have uh, about the highest priority that parents have, which is keeping kids in school? Yeah, so what we're seeing this year is in these first few weeks of January, we're seeing a return to virtual learning in a number of large districts in particular. And they are precisely those districts that were also virtual in last year and both in the January, but also in general. So we're seeing lost schooling among the kids who also lost a lot of schooling last year. And I think that's caused a tremendous amount of concern for those of us who think that schools should be serving our children and that children do best if they're if they're in person. And are you saying that does that suggest, I should say, that there's a kind of habit of mind, a kind of habit of the heart in those school districts that did it last year, that that now that's part of their uh, toolkit in addressing schooling? I, I think there's a piece of that, but I actually think a much more significant issue is that many of these are districts with more limited resources. So at the moment, a lot of districts are facing a staffing shortage, they're facing a bus shortage, they're facing a, uh, a teacher shortage. And in order to serve their students, they need to think creatively or they need to expand outside. They need resources to get teachers who are uh, who are maybe substitutes or maybe retired teachers. And without having planned for that in advance, which I think many of these districts did not, with limited resources, they're struggling to, to do that staffing. And so I'm hoping that we can get support from the state, from the federal government, in order for these districts to be able to come to sort of come through this and to return to in-person learning. But it's a it's a challenge just given the basic staffing problems right now. Well, let's drill down on that and the problem and, and what the federal government might be able to do. In Massachusetts this morning, Boston city officials announced more than 1,000 teachers and staff at Boston public schools were out on the first day back in school after the break because of COVID infections. And uh, we were just covering President Biden a little while ago. He said schools should not have to close because we have the tools. What are those tools? What can the federal government do, do you think, uh, to help school districts keep the schools open? So I'm not sure that this is at this point a job for the federal government as much as it is a job for states and for individual districts. Um, I think that you know one answer is resources. Schools maybe have resources. Another answer is helping schools think about where can they access retired teachers, where can they access additional substitutes, uh, you know where can they access creatively you know college students who are on break who need to uh, who have some some opportunities to to be in the classroom. I mean this is not hopefully not a long term issue over the next it's more of an next four weeks issue but i think we need to be creative so kids can be at school and and you know for parents i've got three three little ones still i'm an older dad uh, in grammar school is there any sense any data any insight into what impact this is having uh, on kids to mental health but also on the, on their progress towards adults and towards being fully educated uh, citizens and adults in our country so we looked, uh, we used our data to look at what happened last year over the sort of scope of the entire year for students that had more in-person versus less in-person learning. And what we see is very large losses in terms of learning. And those losses are much bigger in districts where there was less in-person schooling. So we see very clearly that that virtual schooling isn't delivering the same kind of learning outcomes. And we know, I think, as parents, that it is also affecting the mental health of our students, it's affecting their physical health in other ways outside of COVID. There's just a tremendous amount of evidence that schools are delivering so much that's important to our kids in terms of supporting their mental health, supporting their emotional health, supporting their, their learning. And I think given all that, we just have to start making it a priority to serve children in a way that we have not throughout this entire pandemic. Hmm. And now the other side of the equation, parents. You know, my wife works uh, from home, so she's the one at home when the kids are home. And uh, any advice for parents 
who are at this point, they just see no end in sight. I think part of it is just a, a little bit of advice to like accept the inevitable disruptions as difficult as that is. I think we're all kind of having a bit of PTSD and, and in some ways there's just a kind of feeling of we have to get through this, we have to get through this. And I think that's, um, you know, that's part of what's hard. People just want to know when is it going to when is it going to end? And I wish that I had a better answer than I think it will end, um, but I don't know when. And widen out now for the wider society. A lot, a lot of Americans, they don't, they don't have school-age kids. A lot of Americans don't have kids. Uh, you know, for those who have not been juggling the responsibilities in parent, uh, parenthood and the uh, pandemic, you know, what do you want non-parents to know? How can, how, how can we share uh, this burden and, and this challenge? I mean, I think that, you know, part of it is asking, tell, asking people to, you know, be flexible or be understanding that, uh, that parents are facing these, uh, these issues. But I also think there's a very broad point in society that even if you are not a parent or you are not a parent of small children, I think we should recognize that children are actually a very important part of society. And we've spent a lot of the last couple of years uh, kind of not putting their needs first. Uh, and even if you are not literally parenting a small child, there they, they, is a part of society I think that we should be valuing more than more than we have been. That's a great point and I know you've been on that in your work for a while now so Emily Oster we thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.